So, you are to read good chunks of Bondage of the Will, and it gives you a good flavor for Luther, a little bit of what's going on in here, and I hope it did at least anyway. And um, there's a lot to talk about. So, what were your reactions? What'd you think? Yeah, sir. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, um, tell me why. I like his style. It's very much like conversation. You feel like you know he's just kind of having bantering back and forth with Erasmus, and um, he makes like really intelligent points, but it's in kind of a I don't know a really comfortable way to read it. All right, let's just okay. I good. I glad glad you like that. All right, good. Anything else? Reactions? What'd you think? What's going in? Yeah. Sometimes it got a little bit tiring. We'll use to uh, sort through some of the. Uh, Name calling and yeah. other just Luther yeah, being Luther so kind of stuff. Sensitive to those <laughs> it's not so much that it bothered me. I just like, okay, can we get on with the argument now? <laughs> wow. Well, like well, okay, it's not even just name. Like, what's that? What's that? I just have a lot of pages to read. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> That's when you learn to scan through stuff quickly. You just kind of, shh, your eye just, all right, then you're okay. Um, it's not just the name calling. It's even just the um, kind of the all the perfunctory kinds of things and what you go through. Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure, that's just part of it. Now, the thing that's fascinating here is how much is Luther being sincere and how much is sarcasm, you know, and, you know, the sarcasm is pretty thick in here, all over the place. But he, 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 he slides into genuine, I think, concern at times as well. I mean, it's a, little of, it's a little of everything there. But, yeah, that's part of it, and that's part of the reading this. I mean, you, you, you have to deal with 16th century style. This is the rhetoric. This is how they did things, and it's just part of the, part of the deal. So right. ad hominem was okay back then? Yeah, yeah, I was, actually. Ad hominem attacks were not unusual, and you, it was just part of how it went. And it wasn't necessarily because you were you know, hitting below the belt. It was just that's kind of what you did. It was, and people who aren't familiar with this will read Luther and think, oh, Luther was just a nasty guy. Yeah, he was kind of typical. I mean, Erasmus was not above this kind of thing himself. I, if you go back and read some of Erasmus' stuff, he, he'll, he'll engage in this kind of thing as well. So it's not, it's not just Luther. More on that in a minute. Okay, other reactions? It's not like they ever met. You know, Correct. Face to face. So right. With the oh, yeah, so you can just say all kinds of things. You're not face to face. Well, so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to get the other guy's attention <laughs> somehow. All right. Okay, good. So, no, no other reactions. Anybody like, wow, I can't believe Luther said this stuff? Or, really? I was just curious about Erasmus. Like, who is he? Where yeah. did he come from? We'll talk together. about that. All right, good. Uh, one who compiled the, uh, I guess, standard Greek text that actually... Oh, you're answering the question for Drew already here. Oh. All right, no, that's fine. That's good. You can do that, Josh. That's fine. Yeah, all right, we'll start there. So let's, let's do our, some context then. So, um, who's Erasmus? He was a dude. He was a dude. Erasmus of Rotterdam, a really smart guy, one of the first of the humanists kind of guys, and um, kind of even sometimes the prince of humanism, often called. And this guy, Erasmus was, was a remarkable guy. And he, in many ways, was a key figure in even the Reformation taking place because of his careful exegetical textual kind of stuff. He was a Greek scholar, and he was one of these guys who was starting to kind of go back and rediscovering a lot of these texts and going back and looking at the Greek and doing stuff. And he actually produced a text in the New Testament, which was um, used by, all, by Luther and Melanchthon and everybody. They were using Erasmus's work. So he was a key player in this. So that's part of it. So that's his intellectual kind of thing. He was a philosopher. He was a humanist in every sense of the word, in every positive sense of the word. In classic kind of um, early Renaissance. I mean, really early, because he's older than Luther. He precedes Luther a little bit, kind of where he falls in this. Now, the other thing with Erasmus, if I remember right, I, I could be wrong on the, the age there, but I'm pretty sure. Now, the other thing about Erasmus is, um, he was also an outspoken critic of the church. I mean, a rather strident critic of the church. And so I think, remember, it's, I haven't researched all this ever recently. I think it's in Praise of Folly, was Erasmus's, some of you guys know this stuff better than I do, was the book he wrote, or the little kind of, um, the attack he wrote, really just ridiculing the church. And was really st strong, you know, pointing out some of the same, many of the same abuses that Luther was concerned about, all the kinds of um, corruption that was in the church, and he was just blasting the church. And there were, in fact, many people who were pretty sure that Erasmus would just kind of go with Luther, and that Erasmus and Luther would be, you know, champions together. And Erasmus, for a while, was kind of teetering, and some people thought he would actually kind of fall, fall over to the side and go with Luther. Um, but he didn't. 
And this is kind of, um, we look at Rasmussen and think, yeah, you weasel, you wimped out. And um, we kind of, you know, have that assessment of him. But of course, others have a different assessment. But basically, Erasmus, <coughs> most people would say, kind of decided to hedge his bets and said, um, I'm not ready to go that way. I don't want to forsake the church, and I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll pull back. And so he was willing to take shots at the church, but when push came to shove, he rolled over and towed the line for the pope. And in uh, many ways, his book, which was titled The Free Will, Freedom of the Will, was what his little pamphlet he wrote, was, in a sense, his, um, you might say, <clears throat> making up to the pope. Um, yeah, and saying, look, I can play the party line here. I can be a team player. I'm on your side, and I'll do this. And so he cranked it out. And and then everybody kind of knew, all right, fine. So Erasmus is not going over with the Reformation. Erasmus is going to stick with, with the church, and that's where it went. And you remember Luther made some comment along the way here, said that, hey, come on, Erasmus, let's be honest. If it weren't for me, you'd be the target of the Pope's venom. But because I'm around, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the scapegoat, and you get off easy. But, you know, they, the Pope doesn't like you either. And, you know, so this is, and that's true. I mean, that was basically the truth. So that's where Erasmus is coming from. So that's kind of the story. Um, <clears throat> it's always one of those, it's kind of the, from our standpoint, a little bit sad that Erasmus just didn't quite have the guts to go over because it would have been really interesting if he had. But he didn't. And so that, it ended up where it ended. So does that help? All right. Um, good. So that's Erasmus. And we're already dealing now with what's going on here. So Erasmus was writing with Luther in mind. And also with some of the others. Because like, remember, this is early Reformation. All right? What's the date on bondage of the will? 2021. That's right. 21. This is early. This is early. Remember, 95 theses go up when? 17. So we're within just a few years. Okay? This is still early on. Um, this is part of that really hugely productive time period of Luther. The early 20s, Luther was cranking out some of his most significant essays. Freedom of the Christian, um, Babylonian Captivity of the Church, uh, The Bondage of the Will. Uh, these were all just bang, bang. They were just coming out. And these were hugely important things. Temporal authority, to what extent it should be obeyed. All this stuff, these really significant essays were coming, rolling out. And, but this is still early on. And so this is the, the the Reformation is kind of getting started, and Luther at this point is still kind of being identified with some of the previous critics of the church, like John Huss and Wycliffe. And that's why often um, Erasmus just kind of rolls them together and deals them together, you know, Wycliffe, Luther, and this kind of stuff. So that's going on there. So that's a little bit that. So Erasmus writes this in an attempt to try to um, quell the fires of the Reformation a little bit and slow things down and kind of put Luther in his place. And so he writes this, and everybody's just kind of waiting. <laughs> oh, man. Luther's going to get really flipped out on this one, guys. Wait for it to happen. And it's a little bit like when you write an, a provocative email to somebody, and then you keep on, check, you kept, keep on checking your inbox, you know, waiting. Has he answered yet? Oh, yes, man. What's going on? And then, you, what's happening? Why didn't he didn't get it? And, you know, you wonder. And so that's kind of what was happening. So Erasmus did this, and everybody's kind of just waiting. <gasps> what's Luther going to do? And so that's why Luther even talks about this. You know, he didn't answer right away. He waited. A while, a couple years, you know, it's kind of sad on it. And then finally he gets around to answering, and then you get bondage of the will. And out it comes. And out it comes. All right, good. So that's kind of the setup here, all right? Now, one more thing, just about the, some of the stuff you guys are concerned about, the style, the rhetoric. This is a great example of 16th century rhetoric going full tilt and how Luther's going to go about this. And you have the ad hominem attacks, and you have the kind of um, willingness to name call and to ridicule. This is just kind of part of how they did things. Now, does this excuse it and say we should do the same? Not necessarily, but don't get too worked up about it, all right? It's just kind of part of, part of the game. And I agree with Sarah. Enjoy it and let, let it be fun instead of getting all worked up about it. Like, oh, this is kind of embarrassing. No, it's not. Just let Luther be Luther. Um, and you get a good taste of what Luther's really like here in this. You really do. Uh, and he just doesn't need to be done. I'll say this. What is it that really motivates Luther, and when does he get the most ticked off? And you'll see this consistent with Luther all the way through. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think this helps you to kind of get some perspective on this. Luther doesn't attack just to attack. To correct? He, he, he seems to get ticked off when, when Erasmus either misquotes scripture or places something greater as greater than scripture. You, you, you are on track. I don't think scripture is the issue. It's the gospel. The gospel is the issue. The gospel is absolutely the issue. 
If the gospel is under attack, Luther comes unglued every time, all through his career. And the one thing you see really consistently with Luther is he will not let anything threaten the gospel. And when the gospel is threatened, he let, pulls out all the stops and he lets it roll. He has no embarrassment about that. And I think this is the, one of the keys to understanding Luther, because people, frankly, get really embarrassed by Luther. Oh, he said some horrible things. And, you know, at the end of his life, he said some really horrible things. There's a rather nasty essay he wrote against, against the um, Jews, you know, not, not one of his finer moments for a lot of us, but people said, how could he do that? He was anti-Semitic. Well, I don't think he's anti-Semitic at all. You know, he saw that as another threat to the gospel. And that's what concerns him. And so Luther's pretty indiscriminate. If somebody's threatening the gospel, they're a target. And he'll go after him with everything he's got. And we get uncomfortable with it. We don't like it very much, but that's what he's doing. Now, does that excuse everything? No, but I think it gives you a little perspective on where he's coming from and what's going on with Luther. So in other words, some people think well, Luther, ah, he was just crabby. He liked to pick on people. Ah, no, I don't believe that at all. And especially when you start reading Luther's table talk, he wasn't by nature a crabby guy. He really wasn't, and he was rather, he liked people. He enjoyed them, hanging out, you know, that's the way Luther was. He was rather a gregarious kind of guy. And so that's not what's, it's not a, bad, not, not a matter of just he was, had a bad temperament. It's really an issue of the gospel cannot be threatened. And if somebody's going to mess with the gospel, he's my enemy, and I'll let him have it. That's, what, that's what how you need to understand Luther, and that's consistent. All right? Good. <clears throat> now. The other thing that's also interesting to notice before we start getting into the details here and really kind of looking at some of the stuff, and we don't have time to do all of it because it's just too much to talk about, but I'll try to hit some highlights and then give you some overall p picture of this thing. The other thing that's interesting to think about with Luther is this particular text, Luther starts out by essentially trying to do almost a line-for-line -line refutation of Erasmus. That's his goal, and that's what he's going to do. So uh, Erasmus starts off, and the very first chapter in Luther is, the preface, and he's, he's going he's to take Luther, Rasmus, you said this, Rasmus, here's what I say. You said this, here's what I say. And he had the intention of getting through the whole book. Well, after writing about 200 some pages, and he's only a fraction of the way into Rasmus, it's kind of like he said, eh, the rest of it's all the same, I'm out of time, forget it. And he just basically throws in the towel. He doesn't even get down with his job. So he never even finishes what he set out to do, which was to cover the whole of Rasmus. He doesn't. He doesn't even cover the, all of every argument. He just gets tired of it because it's all the same and it doesn't really matter. And he gets, to the, the, he gets to the core of it and he's done. He writes it off. So it's kind of interesting that way also, just how this thing kind of plays out with what Luther does and what he doesn't do. All right, good. So let's take a look at some of the stuff in Luther. And we're going to kind of skip around. I'm going to hit what I think are some of the highlights. If there's something that you think is really important or something you're wondering about, stick your hand up somewhere along the way and we'll try to address it. But otherwise, we'll do what I want to do. And... Um, Make sure you look at this thing covered, more or less. Okay? Okay, good. Right off the bat, let's go to page 103. First, or second paragraph, right in the middle of the page. It was then, neither pressure of work, nor the difficulty of the task, nor your great eloquence, nor any fear of you, but sheer disgust, anger, and contempt. Or to put it plainly, my considered judgment on your diatribe that damped my eagerness to answer you. So, why didn't he answer right away? He was just too agitated. He was just too irritated. He just couldn't bring himself to deal with it. So he just, and so that's what he says. You know, I wasn't busy. I wasn't afraid of you. Certainly wasn't afraid of you. I just was so disgusted by this, I didn't want to deal with it. That's what he says. Now, the other thing that comes up all the time is this word diatribe. So what does that mean? That's the name of Erasmus's paper. And it just basically means dialogue. Okay, or discussion. All right, so then, and this becomes a big point. So let's start here, with this, as we start getting into the details here. Diatribe. Luther takes this, and he uses this like a kind of a synecdoche. And so diatribe is the name of Erasmus's work, and so what does Luther do? He just starts calling Erasmus diatribe. And, of course, diatribe is a Latin. It would be a feminine noun, it turns out. So he talks about she does this, she does that. And who is he talking about? Yeah. Now, is this meant to be demeaning? I don't think so. He's not trying to, you're the little girl. No, he's not doing that. What he, but it's just that diatribe is a feminine noun, so he uses the feminine pronoun. So that's what's going on there. But, yeah, he, he associates Erasmus with his argument, which is part of what's going on here. Now, there's, there's a rhetorical move that Luther's making, I believe. Because the, and the reason he picks on this word so much is not just because that's the title Erasmus happened to choose, but because of what the word means. 
It's a dialogue. It's a conversation. It's a kind of a, an exercise in thinking, almost. And that's what Luther finds so absolutely repulsive. Because for Luther, this topic is not something for mere intellectual discussion. And that's what you have to understand about what, where Luther's going with this whole thing and why this is so important to him is this is not a matter of hmm, academic inquiry. Let's think a little bit about free will today. All right, what do you think? Oh, I think this. Oh, I think that. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, let's talk some more tomorrow. Who says, you got to be kidding me. This is not a topic for idle conversation. This is not a topic for philosophical speculation, something to do on a Saturday afternoon with your friends. That's not what's going on here. Or better yet, a Friday night with, over a few beers. That's not what this is. This is not just some kind of academic exercise. This is serious business because we're talking about free will. We're talking about divine grace. And we're talking then ultimately about salvation. Salvation hangs in the balance. The comfort of sinners hangs in the balance. People's eternal destiny hangs in the balance, Erasmus. What are you doing calling it diatribe? Get a life, Erasmus. That's what's going on here. See, that's why Luther chooses this word. He, in a sense, every time he says diatribe, it just, ugh. And that's part of what the problem is. And he just kind of needles every time. Diatribe. You got it, you idiot, Erasmus. That's really what's going on here. You just can't believe that he's going to limit it to a, a mere dialogue. So there's no mere dialogue. This is way too weighty. And that's part of why he has such vehemence against Erasmus, because he feels like Erasmus is just kind of daintily dancing around and playing all these nice word games and being very intellectually deft. And, you know, isn't that, wow, look at, this, look at that slick move. But he's not coming clean, and he's not doing what he should do, which is to, you've got to deal with this straight up, because people's lives hang in the balance, Erasmus. You're playing games, and you shouldn't be. So that's part of what's going on here. And that's why this reference to diatribe, diatribe, diatribe all the time, because it's meant to kind of in your face, you dummy. That's essentially what he's doing. Okay? Uh, Erasmus trained as a <coughs> theologian as well. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Erasmus knew his theology. Yes. Just, well, see, in this time, this is when you have the Renaissance man. I mean, this is kind of the tail end of the, you know, kind of the Renaissance period is in here. But remember, a Renaissance man is different than our, our intellectuals today. Intellectuals today tend to be specialists, and they know one thing and nothing else, which is why you have the idiot egghead, which is a pretty common problem. Um, and so, you know, they, 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 they're an expert in this, but nothing else. But the Renaissance man was not that. The Renaissance man, the whole point was he knew everything. And there was a time in history when you could almost do that. You know, kind of a cool thought. You could almost accomplish, I, have no, I know everything there is to know about everything. Wow. You know, nowadays, you just, you, how can you? There's just too much to know in any one field. But in that, in that time, you could. So the Renaissance man knew his physics. He knew his theology. He, yeah, he knew stuff. He knew his astronomy. Of course. Of course he did. So, yeah, he knew the theology. Man. What's that? So they, were truly they were actually Renaissance men. Yeah, isn't that cool? How about that? Renaissance men in the Renaissance. Wow. Maybe that's where it came from. All right, page 105, middle of the page. Now, this is part of where I was just kind of driving at with you. This is the second full paragraph about halfway through. Um, well, it's could they read the whole paragraph, second paragraph. I take it, as it is only fair to do, that you say these things in a kindly and peace-loving spirit. But if anyone else were to say them, I should probably go for him in my usual manner. So, in other words, I'm being nice. <clears throat> and I ought not to allow even you, excellent though your intentions are, to be led astray by this idea. For it is not the mark of a Christian mind to take no delight in assertions. On the contrary, a man must delight in assertions or he will be no Christian. And by assertion, in order that we may not be misled by words, I mean a constant adhering, affirming, confessing, maintaining, and an invincible persevering. Nor, I think, does the word mean anything else, either used by the Latins or by us in our time. So, what Luther is doing is he's setting up a contrast between diatribe, dialogue, and assertion. And his point is, hey, if you're going to be Christian and be faithful, you better make assertions. We don't just dialogue. Now, this is part of what I have tried to impress upon you guys as teachers in the church and as pastors in the church and as leaders and servants in the church because when you teach God's people, you better do it with authority. And I, I'm serious about this. I've come to realize this, and I've sat through way too many Bible classes, which are absolutely disgusting, because the prof or the teacher or the leader does not teach with authority. 
They're afraid to say, thus saith the word of the Lord. Well, maybe this, maybe that, maybe that. And everybody's kind of like, what the heck is it? Well, whatever. It's not helpful. And this is kind of what Luther is saying. He said, come on. If it's true, it's true. Make assertions. Quit messing around. And you guys need to do this. And I don't care what your personality is. You just need to do this. Keep in mind, my personality by nature is rather retiring and laid back. I know. No one ever can believe that. <laughs> but it's, um, it's true. I, I'm introverted by nature. Do not like meeting people, frankly. Hate parties. <laughs> really. You, know, I, you walk me in a room with people I don't know, I, don't, I could care less about meeting any one of them. Leave me alone. I don't like it. Um, but when it's an issue of, this is, I'm here to declare truth, I'll do the job. And when I was in a parish pastor, everyone in the parish was absolutely convinced, oh, man, you're just, you know, extrovert, ex, you know, going, no, nah, not at all. But that's what they saw me do, because that's what I had to do. And so I'm telling you guys, you need to do what you need to do. And when you're charged with, I'm here with the responsibility of public proclamation of God's truth, don't shy away from it. Do it. God's church expects it of you, and they need you to do that. Do it. All right. And, I, and see, to my, in my, cre to my, um, Defense, I've got Luther on my side, and that's always a good thing to have. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> now, go on to page 109, and we're still on this whole theme of this problem of the assertion diatribe, the dialogue thing. We're not even to the guts of the argument yet. Luther's just still taking really ex real great exception to this whole premise of Erasmus. So bottom of 109, uh, at the bottom of the section there, this, by the way, is one of the first of many, many, many of these kind of like famous quotes from Luther. There are so many in here. It's sort of like when you read, you know, Shakespeare and you get these Shakespeare quotes, you know. This is, this is just loaded with these great Luther quotes. Here's one of them. The Holy Spirit is no skeptic. This is the last few lines. And it is no doubts, and it is not doubts or mere opinions that he has written on our hearts, but assertions, more sure and certain than life itself and all experience. Famous line. The Holy Spirit is no skeptic. And now, there's another loaded word for you. Sophist, loaded word. Skeptic, loaded word. Now, skeptic can be little s. Okay, this means you're kind of not sure about things. But skeptic can also be capital S. Because remember, during the time of the Greek philosophers, there were these skeptics and the cynics who would run around. And they basically made a career out of ridiculing and mocking anybody who would speak about anything and just tore them to pieces just for the fun of it. And what was their goal? Tear somebody to pieces. They had nothing else to do. And Luther is suggesting, Erasmus, you're heading that direction. You're just playing these intellectual games. You're tearing everything down, and you're not making any assertions. The Holy Spirit doesn't do that. The Holy Spirit is no skeptic. He doesn't sow doubts or questions in our mind. He sows certainty in our mind. Sidebar. I've heard too many sermons about doubt is a good thing. Doubt leads us to search, and doubt's a good thing. Doubts are great. I've heard too many sermons say that. Doubt is not a good thing. Doubt is sin. Now, do we have doubts? Sure. Can doubts lead us to dig deeper into the truth? That's fine. But don't go praising doubt. Don't go praising skepticism. These are not things to be praised. These things are antithetical to faith. Now, we deal with them, and we treat people with care when people express these things. We don't try to tell them, oh, you can't say that. We make it free so they can't say that. But we need to realize we shouldn't be encouraging doubt for doubt's sake. It's not a good thing. Faith is a good thing. Certainty is what God calls us to be, and that's what Luther is saying here, too. The Holy Spirit is no skeptic. We're not about questions. We're about confidence in God's promises. All right, that's the setup, okay? Now we get into some of the real heart of the argument. And then, what is the heart of the argument? What's the question? You read it. All right, the question is free will. What role does free will play? That's part of it. Or you might sometimes say, he'll use this word too as kind of a synonym, choice. Free will, free choice. And the question of what role does free will play? What else might you say is the real question? Yeah, thank you. Is there a free will? Let's not beg the question. Let's not just take it for granted that there is. Is there free will? That's the real question. Erasmus says, well, duh, of course. And Luther says, no, <laughs> frankly, no. And this usually puts most students kind of back on their heels a little bit. Because most of us have kind of come to believe, oh, yeah, free will is important. Oh, yeah, free will. Yeah, that's, that's part of what it means to be human is free will. 
and we have become very comfortable with this because we use free will as a really nice answer to some tough questions. Why did Adam sin in the Garden of Eden? God gave him the choice because God gave him free will, and I've heard, you've heard this all laid out. God knew that it was a risky thing to give free will, but he didn't want to have automatic praise because that wouldn't be real praise. That's like programming a computer to tell you I love you. Pff, what's that? So he took the risk, and he gambled, and he gave Adam free will because that's what makes you human. And, well, Adam screwed that up. But, see, that's free will. It has to be there. And we, we, we treasure this. We take it for granted. And Luther says, huh, Adam didn't have free will. And do you have free will? Nope. But not even Adam. See, now that's the real the tough part. Because most of us have come to realize, okay, well, I'm a Lutheran. For no free will. Sin has ruined that. But Adam had it. And Luther would say, no, no, he didn't. Huh. Because Adam was created to do what? God's will. He was obedient to God. God's will was his. Now, did Adam do this because this was delightful to Adam? Well, sure, of course, because he's living the way he's supposed to live, in God's will. It's all good. But the idea that Adam had this free will and God was kind of rolling the dice to see what happened, come on, this is absurd, as if God's not in control. That's Luther's whole point. Is God God? Of course he is. And God's not risking anything. God, and it's like God saying, oh, rats, he sinned. Oh, wish he hadn't done that. Now I've got to come up with plan B. But this is precisely how people in our church are taught to think. Now, is that really what happened? So Jesus was plan B? Remember this? You guys should have, didn't you guys read this last quarter? You read Plaker, Domestication and Transcendence? Oh, man, if you haven't read it, go back. Get it out, read it. The whole point is, was Jesus plan B? No. It was the plan all along, Jesus, God created knowing he would send Christ. God created planning to make Christ incarnate. That was always the plan. Now, that raises some really weird questions for us. Like, you mean he created intending it to happen? No, he's not responsible or the author of sin, and yet he was absolutely in control. And now we're into these sticky problems, and now free will starts to become a great answer to these sticky problems. And that's the attraction of free will. And that's one of the reasons why Luther's going after it. And this is why the doctrine that is being taught here in bondage of the will, I'm convinced the vast majority of the people in our pews have no clue of it and don't believe it. Absolutely don't believe it. I've had experience with that. <laughs> I, I, and the rest of you will soon. <laughs> well, I was at camp and uh, some girls started talking about free wills. Like, that's not what Luther taught. What? No, no, free will, free will. And just gave the crypto Baptist response and I it was like, well, first Corinthians two fourteen, Romans eight seven. Well uh, that, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, scripture only means something when it's convenient. And that's how we operate. So go ahead, Joel. <laughs> um, do we ever talk about angelic free will? Um I don't. Do you want to? <laughs> Thank you for taking it literally. Uh, I mean, there, there was sin before, in a sense, there was sin before Adam sin. There was. Uh, I know we don't talk of it that way. Well, you see, it's you're you're starting to get into questions about the source of evil and where it's coming from. And yeah, you have the angelic free will, which again, see, I'm not sh I'm not really even ready to grant that. Here's the, here's the. All right, let's deal with this one now. Let's just kind of deal with the kind of the big question. What, the, uh, what is the source of this evil? Where did this thing come from? This is a big question. Um, and people go and say, well, what's Genesis 3 say? Well, Genesis 3 says the serpent came and tempted Eve, so the serpent was the problem, and it was Satan's fall, and that's the source. But that's really not the point. And this is what Bonhoeffer gets at, if you remember this from last quarter, in Creation and Fall, that what Bonhoeffer's really getting says, don't go blaming the serpent. Because the serpent's just the spokesman. The real problem is man's rebellious choice. And that's all that really matters, is man's choice. And see, now I think, and I think this is the right answer. And this is kind of what Plaker gets at, too. And this, is, I believe, is the right thing. Any attempt to try to pin down the source of evil, it really amounts to doing a theodicy. Trying to figure out where it came from so we can make God look a little better. But the fact of the matter is, you have this situation. God creates a perfect world. Puts Adam and Eve into this perfect world and says, hey, have a blast. Is it all good? Yep. And God says, thrive, 
be obedient to me. Don't touch that tree over there. That's one of your ways to show your obedience, and just do what you do. And Luther says, every time that Adam and Eve walked past that tree and didn't touch it, they were worshiping God. Kind of a cool angle Luther brings. He calls the tree the place where Adam worshiped, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It wasn't this kind of, oh, poison tree. It was like, yeah, there's that tree. I can't eat from that. Well, I walk by it without eating from it. I'm honoring God. I'm worshiping him. Cool thought. And so it's all good. But yet, somehow, Adam and Eve decided, no, we'll do our own thing. And that's the huge question. Why? Was it because of something God put in them? No. Was it a defect in their creation? No. Well, then, it must have an outside source. Well, no. No. And then you're left saying, it doesn't add up. And the answer is exactly right. It doesn't add up. And so we're kind of right back to the crux tail of Gorham here again. Where's it coming from? If you've got a sovereign God, how can you have a completely sovereign God and yet have man being held responsible for disobeying God when he has no reason to disobey him? And that's why Plaker says, I think brilliantly, sin is frankly irrational. It never makes sense. It never makes sense. And this is true. And you guys are going to live this. You're going to see it in parish practice. You're going to see people coming in with sordid tales of stuff. And you're going to ask this idiot guy who's been involved in an affair. You're going to look at him and say, why did you do this? And he's going to have this blank look on his face, completely blank look. And he's going to say, I don't know. And that's the truth. And it doesn't do you any good to go probing for something more because you won't find it. But see, we don't like that. We want to have a reason. Because if we have a reason, we can feel better about it. Well, then it won't happen to me. Or I can explain it. But there, frankly, is no reason. People are idiots. They sin. Sinners sin. Why? Don't know. And should that scare the willies out of you? Well, frankly, it should. And it should make every one of us say, man, I guess I'm not beyond any of this stuff. Maybe I need to be really careful. Exactly. Point taken. That's what I think is one of the big things here. So the, the truth of the matter is, then, we don't have an answer for where the source of evil is. Beyond to say that man is responsible. And now see, this should start sounding familiar because we're heading back to where I was last time with the whole crux tale of Gorham. What are the two big points? Divine monergism and human responsibility. And that's exactly where we land again. And now you begin to see why I said this is a crucial issue. It pops up everywhere. Everywhere. Okay? All right. Yeah. <coughs> For fear of playing devil's advocate. Oh, go ahead, sir. Please. Situation then. Yes. But can't you say the same about the serpent? Because the serpent then had its own God pleasing will. Oh, absolutely. That chose to yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you see, we know from you know, later dialogue that the serpent is not acting in unilateral. Like he's got you know, satanic influence because this tied in with Satan in, in Revelation. So, yeah. But see, ultimately, you're back to the same problem. Well, well then why did he do it? Or, yeah. And sure, right. It's the same issue. And so you, even with Satan. Well, why did Satan rebel? Who knows? Who knows? You know, there are hints about, you know, desire to be like God, but that's the same thing with motivating Adam and Eve. But why would they desire that when they got everything they need? Don't know. And you're just left with this kind of irrationality of it. And any effort to try to solve it is really a, a theodicy. And don't do theodicies. Just leave it alone. We're not playing that game. Drew. So I know this is theodicy, but isn't the sovereign God in charge of what happens in the universe? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't blame him for evil. That doesn't make sense. I know it does. Well, thank you. You're exactly right. It doesn't make sense. And you see, and I'm glad you guys are starting to wrestle with this, because last time when I laid out the crust telegram, you all sitting there, okay, that's cool, take notes, yeah, okay, got that. And you walk out your glib, come on, you're not thinking about it enough. Because it's that when you start to really wrestle with it, and you start to, it starts to become unsettling. And if it's not unsettling to you, you really haven't thought about it enough. I, I, just the way it is. Because the more you wrestle with it, you're thinking, oh, man, that doesn't work. Now you're starting to realize the, the reality of it. It doesn't. Ultimately, we have to simply cling to the promise of God. It says, this is the way it is. And, and trust me. Trust me. Let me be God. And I'll take care of you. And, we, and as Plakers say, and as Luther says, you look to the cross, not to what you don't know. And that's what he says in here. Hidden God, reveal God, preach God, not preach God. That's where that comes from. That's in here as well. It's great stuff. All right. Good? Okay so far here? Okay, so now, so the big question then is, free will, does it even exist? And what Luther ends up saying is, no, no, it's an illusion. You think you've got it? You don't. No such thing. Uh, f let's, I'll give you one more thing here. What's one kind of um, pause here while we're sitting at the railroad tracks waiting for the train to go by. Um, 
One more th picture here, and this also comes back from last quarter, from the book you read from Plaker, which I reference this a lot because I think he has some really keen insight into kind of these big divide issues that are going on. He uses this really nice illustration, which helps to kind of get your mind around how you have a God who is sovereign with divine monergism and yet human responsibility going. And that's this really great s illustration he uses of, of a classroom having a discussion about a play. And I find this to be really helpful. So let's say we're talking in this class about Romeo and Juliet. And we're discussing today the, um, the death of Romeo. And the question I've put before you is, why did Romeo die? So you guys are offering your answers. And somebody says, well, Romeo died because he was you know, a stupid male. And he woke up and saw Juliet dead, so he just despaired like an idiot and killed himself. That's uh, his fault. Someone else says, no, it's Juliet's fault. Juliet should have known that something could go wrong. She shouldn't have risked this whole p silly plan, so it's Juliet's fault. Someone says, well, no, it's obviously the monk's fault. He didn't get the message soon enough to Romeo, so he messed it up, so it's his fault. And then somebody else says, no, it's the Montagues and the Capulets who are to blame for the feud. And someone else says, no, it's Italian society because they're the ones who allowed the feud. And oh, away we go. All right? Someone else wants to blame the church or whatever. Okay? Then somebody, brilliant guy in the back row, says, oh, I think it's because that's how Shakespeare wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> now, at that point, what is the appropriate response from the teacher? <laughs> the teacher should say at that point, you idiot. Stupid answer. Now, I know you don't have to say that to a student, but that's the truth. It's a stupid thing to say. It's completely out of order. Uh, duh, we should all turn around and look and say, what are you talking about? Shakespeare wrote it. Of course Shakespeare wrote it. We all know that, you idiot. So what? That's not even relevant. What's relevant is we're talking about inside the story what forces are at work, and the author is, is irrelevant. It's not like Romeo saying, okay, what are you going to tell me to do, Shakespeare? What, what's it today? Come on! Inside the story, they're living as the forces in the story, and that's what we sort out. And so for someone to kind of say, well, I think it was because Shakespeare wrote it that way. Ah, come on. You get, come on. You're not even, you know, this is not even, not even worthy of response. Now, see, it's the same kind of thing here. So we live our lives in this world, and we're doing our thing, and we're figuring things out, and we're taking responsibility, and it's all very real to us, and it's very important, and we're doing these things. But yet, ultimately, ultimately, there is the God who is the author and the director and he's doing the whole thing and it's all playing out just exactly as he has planned it and yet what we do matters and is important. Now every illustration starts to break down because there's obviously you know, connectiveness here but that kind of gets at it. And so we live our lives and we have this sense of making choices and deciding things and free will and we have this uh, uh, feeling of doing these things by our free choice and freedom and in reality God's God and it's all happening just the way he's laid it out and you say well then those are incompatible how do you how do you hold them together and you don't you don't you just live, live with both of them it's just the way it's got to be all right and I'm reminded of a um, foxtrot cartoon of you a few years ago you know foxtrot some of you don't know it, but the, the sharp little kid, the second born boy who's the really brilliant one, is um, playing catch with his um, classmate and they're holding the football and the kid's holding the ball and says, go deep. So the kid stops and thinks, so can human free will coexist with a divine sovereign being? And then the other you know, kid responds, too deep. And um, <laughs> so then he, then he goes, um, if Joker killed Batman, he would he really be happy? You know, so <laughs> 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 yeah, it was it was good. <laughs>